appears to be, and let me gather my breath here to say this word, acromega, shit, I'll say the word again, acromegaly, acromegaly, acro, this is going to be the cold open, isn't it? It's <laughs> Welcome to Two Designers Walk Into a Bar, a place where pop culture creatives discover design icons that make us tick, and we share a few cocktails in the process. Today, we celebrate the spooky, cheesy, B-movie posters of the mid-50s sci-fi era. Belief will be suspended, hearts will race, and we'll all need a couple shots of liquid courage as we cower together back in the bar. All right, Todd, today yep. we're talking B-movie posters, we're talking mid-50s, we're talking sci-fi. Mm, I love this look. I love this era. I yes. love everything about it. Yes, me too. Okay, so I'll tell you, I jumped in, I started doing some research, mm -hmm. and there was basically one guy who was really crushing it during this time when it came to B-movie horror posters. Reynold Brown, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, same. He did all of them, didn't he? he Among did. many, many, many other movie posters. Yeah, the guy was really prolific, really incredible. And so I think rather than having, let's say, a designer battle or an artist battle right. or a guessing game, the kind of thing that we normally do, how about we just zero in on two of his posters that were absolutely iconic and absolutely incredible? Spooktacular idea, Elliot. I know there's some really well-known ones just because I was looking to see how much they were going for on the auction market. And, <laughs> yes. You know, it's there's some really well-known ones there. My guess is you've probably chosen one of his one of his top B movie posters. Well, Todd, let me put it to you this way: I'm actively trying to sell your car so I can buy one of the originals. Oh, okay. Then I'm going to guess that your poster has a giant something on it. Well, I'm going to guess your poster has a giant something on it. We've narrowed it down, right, because a lot of <laughs> Reynold Brown's illustrations had giant somethings on it. Um, okay, is your giant something a, an animal, vegetable, or mineral? Hmm. I don't think he did anything with vegetables or minerals, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I think maybe the things became giant due to some sort of alchemy or sorcery that involved vegetables and minerals? Uh, absolutely. Radioactivity, maybe. Radioactive yeah. activity, I should say. Yeah, though yeah. there's definitely, okay. once these things grew, there was a lot of activity. Just ask the townspeople who were being terrorized. It sounds like we're talking about the same movie. Hmm. Well, you know, I think with a lot of these B-movie plots, <laughs> there, there was kind of a central playbook. <laughs> okay, okay. I got, I got a defining question here. Sure. For us. How many legs does the thing on your poster have? I'll say this, Todd. Yeah? Two, but they go all the way up. Oh, you're talking about the attack of the 50-foot woman. I am. I am. Who was way taller than 50 feet on the poster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely talk about it. That was the first thing I noticed. Yeah, apparently Reynold Brown had a little trouble with scale. <laughs> but well, we, we'll get into my that. Creature, my, my creature has eight legs. That uh, should give it away real fast. Well, I, it, well it, it's either on land or in the ocean. I don't know of an eight-legged thing that flies. Uh, you know what? That's true. I didn't think about an eight-legged one in the ocean. Um, okay, well, and... then it's obviously on land, so you tip your uh, hand. Okay, I, I'm going to say it's a giant spider. and But, yes. you know, spiders in and of themselves, I mean, sure, any 50-foot woman is going to strike fear into the hearts of men. But uh, Anybody, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking there are probably some 
types of spiders, they're, say, a little bit more frightening than others. And if we're talking horror, we're talking mm-hmm. B-movie, mm-hmm. Big. I'm, I'm going with the capital T Tarantula. You nailed it, my friend. Ding, 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 ding. You win the Spooktacular Olympics with that. So, Reynold Brown, known, like, historical figure in the world of 40s and 50s illustration and 60s, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And particularly in the genre of B-movie sci-fi. And the movies were interesting and interesting plots, but the poster really sold the hell out of these movies, didn't they? Oh, 100%. 100%. I mean, as we talked about, they were both just very, very iconic posters attack of the 50 foot woman the one i there have been homages done to this poster it's been in scenes for movies and Mm -hmm. countless magnets t-shirts all sorts of things are sold with this image on it it's just incredible okay so tarantula came out in 55 when did 50 foot woman come out i mean i know it was around the same time but yeah 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 Because they were making like, you know, 12 a year or something like that. (laughs) Right. Came out a few years later in 1958. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, Well, uh, since mine was a little earlier, do you want me to start telling you a little bit about that? And then uh, you can probably repeat a lot of the same things and say, (laughs) just replace Tarantula with woman. (laughs) Yeah, this is going to be a really efficient podcast because we can just dub in a lot of the same stuff, I think, and really only do the work once, which not only will be pleasurable for us, but also for most of the listeners. Absolutely. But, you know, I am really interested on a couple things. Would love to hear your take on both of the movies uh, and both of the posters. And clearly there's some similarities um, both in the movies and in the posters. And um, I think we could have a pretty good wrap-up discussion at the end on sort of what all this meant at that particular time. Too. Sure, so, yeah. All right, so a little about Tarantula. Um, again, poster was done by a guy named Reynold Brown. And Tarantula was produced by Universal International in 1955, as I said. And describe, I'll describe the poster a little bit here. It depicts a mob trying to escape a giant 100-foot-tall tarantula. I can't imagine why. I know, I know. I mean, you know, people are afraid of regular-sized tarantulas. That actually is the second most popular phobia. I looked it up, uh, is arachnophobia. Is the first most popular phobia fear of our podcast? Uh, It has to have a fancy Latin name, but yeah, something like that. Oh, 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 podcast a whatever Pod- phobia podcastophobia yeah, yeah. right Got okay it. so giant tarantula in the tarantula's pinchers it's clenching a helpless damsel who is she's wearing like a flowy dress so she's showing some leg too but but she's kind of in the pinchers and i would say you know like we talked about similar to some of Reynold brown's other posters including 50 foot woman there's a little hocus pocus going on with the scale here yeah oh yeah uh, the 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 spider is at least four times larger than three-story buildings that are in the same scene. Yet the woman in the pinchers is kind of correct compared to the size of the stars in the foreground. So speaking of the stars in the foreground, there are two figures, one representing John Ager and another representing Mary Corday. Look, Elliot, they are so terrified that they are literally running out of the frame of the illustration of this tarantula and they're running towards the type that mentions their name, which I think is kind of a clever device. Yeah, absolutely. So they're running out of the frame into the type of the poster. Across the top, which Reynold Brown was known for, these giant letters who, uh, in red block letters uh, against a bright yellow sky are the words, giant spider strikes. And then under that, it says dot dot crawling terror 100 feet high so it's not even three dots like an ellipses it's two dots and it was just it's filling up the space to justify it under the first line which was bigger but they could have just made that line bigger it's such an oddball (laughs) thing i don't know why they did that but i was obsessed with it yeah um Anyway, across the middle of the poster is type that's screaming, Tarantula! And it's in that hand-done, italic type style. 
you know, you know what I'm talking about, where the bass lines and the top lines, they're so energized, they don't, they don't meet, they don't line up, you know, they're just all kind of going wonky different directions. It's kind of, to, to put a little bit more of a contemporary, um, you know, identifier on this, it's sort of in your Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's very Indiana yes, Jones yeah. type, you know, because they were obviously in the 80s paying homage to movies like this. Exactly. So clearly hand done, beautiful type. And this poster, I want to hear your take on other posters as well, but I thought this was a lesson in sort of image layering. The giant spider is both behind and in front of these small buildings. Mm -hmm. It's kind of coming over the, and the giant uh, tarantula type that I just mentioned, it's on top of the spider, kind of pushing it back a little bit, holding it back. Yet the woman in the spider's pinchers drapes over the type so it's all like uh, messing with our heads and <laughs> you know and as i mentioned john Edgar and mara Corday, they're literally running out of the scene into the white of the poster so it's a lesson in layering and you know speaking of the two stars in the front they have some interesting expressions elliot you know i mm -hmm. would expect they're not exactly raw terror like, I would be terrified if a 100-foot tarantula were chasing me. I wouldn't say the, their expressions are raw terror. It's kind of interesting. It's like they have a look on their face like they have been chasing an ice cream truck for a block, and they were looking <laughs> forward to it, only to realize it was driven by a clown. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> so, or like, uh, you know, I don't know, surprise birthday party. But half the people there are people they don't actually like, and that's the surprise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's something like that. It's it's not just crazy terror, but it's a little bit like. Eh. So anyway, uh, we'll obviously we're posting this on our site, so uh, listeners can see for themselves and can leave us comments and argue with me on that. But do you want to hear a little about the movie, Elliot? I would love to because you know with a poster like this. I've already got my ticket money in hand. Oh, yeah. Yep. And I want to know what's going to happen next. All right, good. I'll uh, I'll be as brief as I can. The plot gets a tiny bit complicated. Wait, 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 I'll wait, wait. This is a B-movie sci-fi. Yeah, well, yeah, but okay, just wait. There's so many, there's so much subtext happening. I see, okay. All right, first of all, it takes place in Arizona. There you go. There is a, a doctor. His name is Matt Hastings. He's been called into town. He's played by John Agar, by the way. Um, he's been called into town to investigate a strange death. They appear to be suffering from acromegaly. <laughs> Whatever. A disease which, that which makes is you... a, Which is a speech impediment where you can't pronounce <laughs> medical terms properly. <laughs> acromegaly. Uh, which is a rare condition <laughs> when the body produces too much growth hormone. So your hands, your fingers, your extremities, your features get abnormally large. You, there's a joke in there. I know you'll think of one. Anyway, Hastings visits the lab of the deceased and meets his colleague, guy named Dr. Deemer, but does not learn Dr. Deemer is experiencing also acromegaly. <laughs> so, and he's doing experiments with radioactive elements to produce this his its goal is to produce artificial super nutrient which when it's perfected it could help provide an unlimited food source for humanity which is kind of cool you know it's in the 50s think about that radioactivity atomic age people were afraid better living through chemistry right 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 but um in his lab we see their giant rabbits rats and of course a tarantula the size of a dog hastings doesn't discover all that when he leaves, Dr. Deemer, the guy doing the experiments, is attacked by another deformed lab assistant, and the lab gets all broken up, the tarantula escapes, and the lab assistant dies. So just suddenly, as luck would have it, this beautiful, out-of-town new lab assistant named Stephanie, in quotes, Stevie Clayton, arrives to assist Dr. Deemer to be his new lab assistant, since he keeps losing them. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah. I know. From Acromegaly. <laughs> the disease, uh, you shall not say its name. Yeah, the disease That's right. That's whose right. name will never be said. That's right. 
So, as by weird circumstance, Hastings meets her at the bus station and says, Hey, I was going out to Dr. Deemer's mansion anyway. Why don't you come with me? So they go out there and they learn that all of the animals have escaped. Is this like kind of a Scooby-Doo sort of mansion? Yeah, it is. I mean, there's a laboratory in the giant mansion. And so Hastings starts investigating like these, all these cattle are dying in the desert and their bones have just been picked clean. And they're these large white petals of goo. And Stevie reveals the secret experiments, the Hastings. And that angers Dr. Deemer. And Hastings learns the goo is actually spider venom. And it rushes back to the mansion where he finds the doctor near death. So the doctor confesses that he killed the lab assistants. And that at the same time, the giant tarantula that had escaped, that was the size of a dog, is now 100 feet tall. And he starts attacking the mansion. So Stevie and Hastings, they hop in the car to get away. The doctor is killed because the mansion falls on him from the tarantula. (laughs) And so Hastings and Stevie, they're in the car, but nothing, Elliot, can stop this spider from pursuing them. There's bullets. There's dynamite. There's everything. They have no effect until they call in the Air Force. They're dispatched to launch a napalm attack that eventually incinerates the spider the end scene wow what do you think that smelled like yeah napalm spider Hmm. i don't know i would want to smell that in the morning no so kind of a lot of references there like we were talking about with radioactivity chemistry napalm you know weird stuff all right so there's some coda to some of this and where the actors ended up but I want to hear more. I want you to take me to the movies, Elliot. Tell me about this 50-foot woman. All right. I'll be Siskel to your Ebert. Thank you, sir. So, as I mentioned before, Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. um, Iconic poster. Less iconic movie. (laughs) But the poster is absolutely incredible. So, let's go into the poster a little bit and uh, and, and start talking about uh, that. And then we'll talk about the movie a little bit. So... The poster, just to give you some like quick accolades here, the poster was actually ranked number eight on the 25 best movie posters ever by Premier Magazine. So this is wow. like an iconic thing, right? I would like to see the seven above it. Yeah, yeah. I would too. I would Ghost too. Bu- if Ghostbusters is not one of those seven, then there is nothing right in this world. And if Airplane isn't also one of those seven. God. I know, I know. Like you can't trust Hollywood. We've had this discussion yeah, before. Yeah, I know. I know this is, well, we could, that, that's a whole that's podcast a unto itself. Thing. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Anyway, this poster shows a woman far larger than 50 feet in height, as you mentioned, <laughs> straddling a highway overpass that snakes into the foreground with the skyline behind her of the city against mm-hmm. a bright yellow background. Mm-hmm. So she's dressed in a sort of bikini top and short sort of tennis skirt type of bottom, which is the same costume this woman wears in the film, okay? Where does a 50-foot woman buy clothing that size? Well, apparently, at least when, what I remember from the movie, it was sort of like the bed sheets that she was when she was bedridden when she started. But still, those would have to be massive bed sheets for her to fit into when she's... 50 feet tall because they're wrapping around her waist and wrapping around her chest so I don't know if this was like you know Superman's baby blanket and it stretched and grew as he did mm-hmm, There, mm-hmm. Todd I, I think it goes without saying um, there are some holes in the plot well they gave you an answer just be happy with that exactly what, think, what yeah, more do you, you know don't don't that. focus on the inconsequential details here we're having fun okay this is movie yeah movies yeah. yes all right kid. Let's okay. continue. So anyway, she has a crumpled car. So she's straddling the highway. She's, you know, looking down and she has a crumpled smoking car in her left hand and her claw like right hand following her gaze 
looks like it's getting ready to grab one of the two overturned cars that have collided with one another right in front of her, presumably when the drivers, you know, looked up and spotted this giant woman. Right, right. Then her right foot, which is in the foreground, right near the credits at the bottom of the poster, her right foot is planted on a smoking trailer truck. (laughs) So, like, that's really great. Like, you know, no fucks given. I'm stepping on whatever I need to in order to get these other vehicles and get these other people right there you go and then tiny people as i just mentioned they're scattering everywhere their arms are outstretched so i don't know if they have the same expressions as the people you were uh critiquing earlier in your poster but they are much much smaller much much farther away (laughs) and they're basically (laughs) scattering in every dimension like roaches when you flip the light on like they're just trying to get out of dodge (laughs) Uh (laughs) i mean so it's just great so they're all in the highway overpass fleeing their vehicles, scattering in every direction. Then the movie title. So you talked about this red block type against this yellow sky background. Same device is used for this poster. So red condensed block lettering tucked into the upper left corner of the poster. And then the words attack and woman and the number 50 are all larger than the rest of the titles. This is all in uppercase. You know, like it's screaming Mm -hmm, at mm -hmm, you. Now mm -hmm. I'm kind of bummed because you mentioned your poster has some exclamation points. Mm -hmm. Aside from the period, I love how on this poster they didn't write out foot, F-O-O-T. They just put (laughs) F-T period. (laughs) And then it's uh, attack and woman are larger and then 50 is also bigger it's the same size but that's black so it's Mm -hmm. like just so you make no mistake about the height of this woman it's 50 Mm -hmm. 50 goddamn feet okay (laughs) (laughs) and if i i remember like and this is this kind of shows the development of those three years in between our movies where the type on mine was you know was horizontal went across it kind of covered the illustration the top of the poster yeah i remember this being dare I say, a tad bit more understated on the right-hand side, wasn't it? That it was the illustration that kind of flowed above it a little. Yeah, the the illustration's definitely doing the heavy lifting here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, I just can't help but think, uh, <laughs> going back to, uh, you know, there's just this great way to kind of connect the dots for the person um, debating. Like, I'm thinking about an average moviegoer in small town USA in 1958 and they're walking up and they're trying to make the decision about uh, which uh, which matinee to go to one Saturday mm-hmm, afternoon. Mm-hmm. They c- cut a glance, they get a look at this poster and it's sort of like, as it not registered how tall this dame is, don't you want to see the film? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's 50 feet. <laughs> you know, what are you waiting for? Like, get in there, kid. You know, it's just like... I don't know. It's just so amazing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this poster, if, if people, if as we're talking about it, if it doesn't immediately pop into your mind's eye, we will have it on the episode page. Or, as it turns out, you could see it in some of these other places, which are shows or movies you've already probably seen. Mm. So in the TV series Smallville, mm-hmm. it's in the school newspaper offices, which I think is great because, of course, of the setting and the time that starts to make sense. Right. 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 And, of course, this is kind of B-movie pulp just based on a comic book. It makes sense. Pulp Fiction, one of my favorite movies, what I consider mm-hmm. to be a Quentin Tarantino's masterpiece. This is in Jackrabbit Slims. You know, this is oh. in where they have the dance contest. Yeah. That yeah. scene, right? And then it's also used as the basis for cover art for an Avengers comic book. So you start to see how influential this poster became. It's just this sort of, um, I don't know, this, again, like going back to our Bigfoot and Iwo Jima episode, there are just certain Mm -hmm. images that are just woven into our culture. You almost can't imagine life before they were part of it. It's a sci-fi touchstone, isn't it? Yes, it, it really, really is. Yeah, through. it's 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 sort of a, the poster version of the theremin sound when a UFO lands. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's just everywhere. It's all over. It the has place. to be there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. There's you, you'd feel something were missing if it if it were absent. So yeah. So then a little bit about the movie itself. So like this is this is all fine and good, but you know once you buy your ticket, once you get inside, 
<laughs> what is it that you're going to see? Now, Todd, I'm not going to get as in the weeds, perhaps, as you did. I'm, I'm a simple man with simple okay. tastes. I like a giant woman in a bikini. That's and, enough for you, huh? Yeah, and, and I like a B-movie. Yeah. I mean, really, what what... You know, the fact that there's a plot is purely secondary to me. Well, I'd love to hear about this movie. Okay. So the film's storyline concerns the plight of a wealthy heiress Mm -hmm. um, named Nancy Archer. So Nancy, the character, is the subject of the poster. She is the 50-foot woman. Okay. Okay. And it was played by an actress named Allison Hayes. And the character has a close encounter... So this isn't uh, radiation exactly. This is, you know, this is a few years later. We've gotten more sophisticated, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So her close encounter is with an enormous alien in his round spacecraft. All mm. right? Okay. So she kind of went on a bender, and she's out driving around, and lo and behold, she stumbles upon this alien. I mean, usually that's how it happens. I mean, Todd, that's, that's why you and I stopped drinking me. so much, all the alien right. visitations. That's and right. uh so anyway, so this alien weaves his, his magic, causes her to grow into a giantess. Yeah. And this this happens to complicate her marriage, <laughs> which is already <laughs> on the rocks a little bit due to her husband's philandering. Okay. And, oh. and this is a guy named Harry Archer. So she's Nancy Archer and her husband's Harry. And, mm-hmm. and Harry was played by a guy named William Hudson. Okay. Now, Harry's name is going to be important, as I'll mention in just a moment. <laughs> so she's basically wandering around, you know, she grows to 50 feet. She's wandering around the town now and she's looking for Harry. And Harry, of course, is uh, <laughs> he's living it up, right? He's sort of this cad. <laughs> he's out on the town. He's with another woman. He's drinking, carousing in these clubs. So she decides she's going to go out and she's going to find him. <laughs> it's just, it's and the effects are absolutely great because I remember watching this movie as a little kid. And when she's 50 feet tall, she's sort of wandering around the town. But the way that they were able to do the compositing at the time, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she's sort of translucent looking. Mm -hmm. And I never understood when I was little, like, why is she a ghost? Like, I get that she's big, (laughs) but why is she also a ghost? Like, I could never really sort of put two and two together. And then, you know, of course, as an adult, you're like, oh, they just kind of couldn't pay for anything better. But... So this is one of the joys of of watching this film, though, right? So it has this sci-fi storyline. It has this low budget. It's about a woman bent on revenge. Um, Mm -hmm. She's going around busting up the town. (laughs) So the film attained popularity with with movie fans and obviously has become a cult film, okay? Like, not only based on the poster, many, many more people have admittedly seen the poster than have ever seen the film, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, but the film is still great. Like it is a B movie. It's campy. It's it's wonderful. It really is like one of the examples of what a B movie is. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And what's great was you'll never forget her husband's name once you've seen this film because okay. almost all the time that she's big. She's wandering around the town, busting things up, <laughs> just searching for her husband, and she's yelling. Harry! (laughs) And it's so great because it's just so bad. Okay, uh, do that one more time. I'm going to close my eyes and imagine. Okay, do it one more time. Are you ready? I got to clear my throat. I got to get ready. Okay. Harry! I mean, it's like you're there, isn't it? I mean, it is so amazingly bad. I, on on this podcast, you can probably see I've got goosebumps right now. Yeah. Oh, I can. Yeah. I can feel the way them. You did it. Yeah. The way you absolutely. Did it. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Please continue. Yeah. Uh, so this is such a great B movie, and like I said, the effects are exactly what you'd expect in terms of <laughs> both the era it was made and the and the overall budget. So the budget for this film, like this, is the all in budget. This is. I'm hoping a lot of this went to Reynold Brown <laughs> for the poster, <laughs> you know, to be totally honest with you. So the, the budget in 1958 dollars was a range. I couldn't find the exact amount, but it was a range of about 65 K to about 90 K. So that equates today, you know, you're thinking, well, that's peanuts. 
But that's um, $615,000 to about mm-hmm. $852,000. So still under a million dollars. And if, you know, you think about how movies are made now, even a good indie film with no giant 50-foot woman in it and no Reynold Brown poster costs much, much more than that to oh, me. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So before we switch gears and maybe talk a little bit about Reynold Brown, as we go into the break... I need to, I need to tell you about one of my favorite exchanges in the whole movie. All right. Okay. 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 So she's storming around town, and and the the citizens, so like the sheriff, the townspeople, they all know who she is, right? Because she's this wealthy heiress. She's been in the town forever. So it's not like who is this fifty foot woman? Like they all know exactly who she is. They also know the reputation that her husband has. Like he's. Mm-hmm disguise none of his behavior so they kind of know what's going on and they know why she's upset and pissed off you Harry right okay so so this is going on and there's a great scene where they're all sort of clustered together looking up as this one piece of footage of her semi-translucent body you know is is going across the town busting up different buildings and stuff (laughs) so the dialogue with with a townsperson uh, talking to talking to one of the cops. This is so great. Uh, this is this is the exchange. Okay, she'll tear up the whole town till she finds Harry. Yeah, and then she'll tear up Harry. <laughs> I just <laughs> love that. I thought that was the best, some of the best dialogue writing ever. It was that, so brilliant. And um, did uh, did uh, did this win like a um, screenwriting Oscar that year? I hope so. I, I, I haven't mean, done I have. haven't done the it research, but I mean, hands down, okay. it should. Have. Are you kidding me? <laughs> All right. Well, um, after the break, I want to give you just a little update on some of where the actors and the crew ended up with Tarantula, and then um, let's talk a little bit more about the contributions of Reynold Brown. Giant women and spiders? Todd, how many shots did we have? I don't know, Elliot. I lost count, too. How about we grab a fresh coffee for the second half and meet back here in a few minutes? Hi, while we have your attention, if you want to learn more about us and the podcast, there are a few ways to do it. Visit our website at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com. All of that is spelled out. No numbers kind of a long url so do yourself a favor and bookmark it once you're there you can find links to more information about the subjects in this episode our episode archive and information about both of us wait we do want people to visit right well oh and look for us on social media you can find those links on our website as well and while we're at it if you have a friend who you feel will dig on our rambling Tell him or her what we're up to. While we can't guarantee that they will remain your friend, we can guarantee that they will listen to at least 30 seconds of whatever episode you send them the link to. (laughs) That's being a little shameless. And speaking of being shameless, it wouldn't be a proper ask if we didn't mention that if you like what you hear, you can also make a donation via our website. We have a Nigerian prince handling all transactions for us. In fact, he told us to mention that we have stickers to mail to anyone who donates $10 or more. Are we done? We're done. We're done. Okay. So, Tarantula, it was directed by a guy named Jack Arnold. He also directed It Came From Outer Space, The Mm. Creature From the Black Lagoon, Mm. another universal institution, Revenge of the Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Incredible Shrinking Man, and many, many others before moving to a television career. And check this stuff out. Check out these directing creds. All right. So first of all, let me go back and say the first, the movie that I mentioned first, it came from outer space, another B-movie sci-fi starring a Mr. Who, Russell Johnson, 
the professor on mm, Gilligan's Island. Yes. Jack Arnold directed 26 episodes of Gilligan's Island. What? Yes. He also he directed a bunch of episodes of Peter Gunn and Raw Hyde and and he did a few Perry Masons. Also Love American Style. Mm. You remember that, right? Mm-hmm. Wonder Woman, Bionic Woman, and Love Boat. And sit down for this one, Elliot. Okay. 15 episodes of The Brady Bunch. <laughs> including <laughs> including all of the Hawaii episodes. With a cursed tiki. With the and the curly perm hair. Yeah. yeah. And the famous Oh my nose episode. Yeah, with the football. Yeah. Master. Master. You, you know what? We can end this podcast episode right now. I know. Look at that. I mean, that is just Hollywood legend. But I've got two more little tidbits to share with you. Even more? Um, I know. It's Hold like on. double dessert. I know. John Ager, the guy that played the male lead, he ended up marrying Shirley Temple. Well, not ended up. He actually was married to Shirley Temple and already divorced before this movie was made. He married her in 1945, and that only lasted until 1950 because of his drinking. He had a little bit of a drinking problem, and he had been arrested a couple times. He was like the real-life Harry. He was, and so then he went to get remarried to another woman named Loretta Barnett Combs, and they were going to elope, and guess what? The officials wouldn't marry them because he was drunk again. (laughs) So... (laughs) Anyway, they did get married. They stayed married for 49 years. The end of him. All right, but the real winner in all of this is our leading lady, Stevie, played by Mara Corday. She ended up marrying an actor. I don't know if you remember a guy named Richard Long. He was in 77 Sunset Strip. He was in the Big Valley Mm -hmm. and did a million other guest appearances. Anyway. She gotten out of showbiz, like, pretty soon. I mean, once you've done Tarantula, what else can you do? You really can't do anything. But she had an old showbiz friend, a guy named Clinton Eastwood, that offered her a chance to get back in the movies. Mm. Um, so gave her a little tiny role in The Gauntlet. And then she had a brief, but I would say very significant role in the famous Sudden Impact movie of 1983 so do you, you remember the movie elliot oh yeah yeah the diner scene yeah yeah, yeah, the yeah. Di- okay do you remember are you what do you remember the line that harry says let me see the detective harry callahan yeah that's the well it's iconic yeah go ahead make my day make my day yeah yes. did he fire six shots or only five the the person that he is talking to is holding a gun to Mayor Corday's head. She oh. is the waitress who tried to get his attention by pouring like a thousand gallons of sugar in his coffee. Yeah, because he was a regular there. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and she was tipping him off that something was amiss. Yes. Yeah, yes. I remember that. Now, so you might ask yourself, those are two people that I would not have thought would have been lifelong friends. Well, looked it up and little Clinton Eastwood had an uncredited role in Tarantula as the Air Force squadron fighter. So, there you go. Hollywood comes around. Was this his first movie? It was not his first. His first was actually Creature from the Black Lagoon. Really? He also had an uncredited role. Yes. Oh, man. Both uncredited. Um, but, you know... As sometimes luck has it, Oscar smiles on you. Sometimes Oscar doesn't smile on you. Tarantula had a tough year. In 1955, it was released near the end, like one does when you're trying to get Oscar contention. But also for um, other movies that were released that year, you might have heard of a couple. Blackboard Jungle, East of Eden. Little Jimmy Dean guy was in that one. The Seven Year Itch, Marilyn Monroe, Lady and the Tramp, To Catch a Thief, Oklahoma, and a little ditty called Rebel Without a Cause. So, unfortunately, Tarantula didn't have a didn't have an opportunity to win an Oscar. And again, I'll say it: I knew Hollywood was rigged at that point. Yeah, when you have two James Dean movies in the same year, 
Yeah, and he dies. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what are you going to do? Well, you know, I'm still amazed that Clint Eastwood is sort of the Kevin Bacon of Hollywood. I mean, he's just been in so many movies. Yeah, yeah. Who knew? Yeah. So, anyway, the guy that brought us both here today is Reynold Brown, the illustrator of these two great posters as well as many other Hollywood posters. And... I, I know a little about him. I didn't find out a whole lot, though. I knew he was obviously uh, an artist, and I knew he taught at Art Center, I think it was. Maybe, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, had a really great, wonderful career and uh, a long career. But um, do you know more about him? Oh, Todd, you, me, and Wikipedia, we know all about him. Come on. Okay. Come on. All right. We uh, have the world's knowledge at our fingertips here. When I saw this this Attack of the 50-Foot Woman poster, I just thought, yeah, who is this person? Who's behind this? You know, who did this mm-hmm, iconic mm-hmm. thing that, as we said, has appeared in a lot of places, has influenced a lot of different um, subsequent pieces of art. So William Reynolds Brown was born in 1917, and he, as we discussed was an artist who painted a lot of Hollywood film posters, but he also briefly worked as a comic book artist as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, he was from California. uh, As you mentioned, he attended Alhambra High School, and he started to meet cartoonists, you know, when he was in his late teens, around 20, and he started to um, ink a comic strip by a, a gentleman named Hal Forrest called Tailspin Tommy. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't credited for that. You know, Forrest would draw it and he would was one of the inkers. And so I think that really started to help him dial in his skills. So have you ever heard of an illustrator that goes by the name of uh, Norman Rockwell? Does that name ring a bell? How is it pronounced again? Uh, Rockwell, I believe. Rockwell. Yeah, sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. Did, uh, you know... Uh, like Santa Claus and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Saturday okay. evening yeah, something yeah, or yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saturday yeah. evening something. Yeah. Might have turned into something. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so his sister <laughs> was a teacher at Brown's High School. Shut up. Yeah. Really? And then through Rockwell's sister, Brown later met Norman Rockwell himself, who said, if you want to be taken seriously as an illustrator, you got to get out of this comic stuff. Like, you got to mm-hmm. just, like, commit to illustration. So... You know, sure, yeah, follow Norman Rockwell's advice. There are far <laughs> worse people you could be listening to. Right, right. So he subsequently won a scholarship to the Otis Art Institute. So during World War II, as you can imagine, all hands on deck, everybody's doing something. So he ends up working for a company called North American Aviation. Mm-hmm. And there he met his wife, and he created all of these very, very detailed cutaway illustrations of all these different airplanes that this company was selling. And they're absolutely incredible. You know, you can go online and you can find these. Maybe we'll post one or two examples on our episode page as as well. I mean, so the guy was a draftsman. He had an incredible eye for detail, which is sort of funny when you think about what we were mentioning (laughs) earlier, where the scale was so woefully off. So the only thing that I can think is that it was for like dramatic effect, right? Again, it's, it's, just getting getting butts in seats, you know. For yeah, these or movies. the producer, he was like, "How big do I make the woman?" And the producer was like, "I don't know, just big, make it yeah, big, big, yeah, big. like kind of like the make just get out make the the, instead of make the logo bigger, it's make the creature bigger." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he did magazines and a bunch of that stuff. Yeah, too, which yeah, 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 a lot yeah, of yeah. Illustrators yeah. did. Yeah. So jokingly, we we mentioned a minute ago Saturday Evening Post, obviously the domain of Norman Rockwell. That's what made him famous. But um, Brown also did Saturday Evening Post covers. He did mm. he did covers also for Argosy, Boys Life, Outdoor Life, Popular Aviation. That makes sense. But mm-hmm. another iconic magazine still around today is Popular Science. And he, I think, mm. due to the fact that he was a draftsman, as we've talked about, he did several Popular Science covers. Now, as luck would have it, I have a popular science book that is mm-hmm. like 150 years of 
covers and topics. And so I dug into this book and lo and behold, it has several of his um, covers in it. One is great. It's uh, something like a, uh, a family in a convertible sedan and there was some sort of rooftop parking situation, like a parking garage, and it's uh-huh. s- dangling almost horror movie style or suspense movie style off of the, the precipice, off the edge of the roof of this building. And the the headline is something like, if I remember correctly, could this happen to you? <laughs> and that makes oh, me... I, I've seen that, yeah. It's yeah. like they're driving off the building or something. Yeah, like and it may, I'm like, yeah. a, is this like a story about brake pads? <laughs> like, what is this? <laughs> you know, it, it, there, it begs further inquiry. Yeah. And then he, he also put together some uh, paperback uh, book covers as well. And you mentioned that uh, this guy taught at the Art Center College of Design. So, like, all of this stuff is going on, but that still doesn't really get to the heart of how did he start doing all these movie posters? Yeah, yeah. Right? So, as luck would have it, when he was at Art Center, he met a woman named Misha Callis, and she was the art director at Drumroll. Universal Pictures, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And so through her, he began doing his film poster work. That's okay. So that's why he was involved with all those classic Universal yes. monster creature films. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned some of the the movies and sort of what was going on at the time. You mentioned Creature from the Black Lagoon, little Clint yes. Eastwood's first film that he did uh, the poster for, Brown did the poster for. Now, I'm going to give you, so we've basically zeroed in on sci-fi, B-movies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Creature from the Black Lagoon, another iconic B-movie. Now, I want to talk to you about some other, what I'll refer to as some of Hollywood's greatest hits and the, and just iconic movies and he did the posters for these as well. So, like, I don't want, even though he did comics work, even though he did some mm-hmm, illustration, mm-hmm. he did much more than kind of this B-movie schlock kind of stuff that you and I both love. Okay? Mm-hmm. 1958, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with Elizabeth Taylor. Wow, same year as 50-Foot Woman. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's exactly. quite a resume. Bill. Ben Hur, 1959 with Charlton Heston. Wow. A little movie in 1960 called Spartacus. With Kurt Douglas. Wow. Was into his uh, sandal period. (laughs) That's that's right. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Same year, The Alamo with John Wayne. Who didn't wear sandals? Not to my knowledge. Maybe when he was not not in front of the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. A couple years after that, Mutiny on the Bounty with Marlon Brando. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Now, Todd, we have to drift back for at least a time in a a B-movie. But this is a good one. Mothra versus Godzilla. Oh, I love that movie. 1964. Yeah. Wow. Great. Okay. And then the last, but certainly not least, Shenandoah with uh, with, uh, uh, with with Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. So Man. all kinds of amazing poster work, just amazing Hollywood work in general. And in fact, and you'll love this, this, this might be one of the best documentary titles I've ever read. All right. Okay. So 1994, as it should be, Brown's life was subject of a documentary. And the the title of the documentary, if people want to look it up, is The Man Who Drew Bug-Eyed Monsters. (laughs) (laughs) I got to watch that. Yes, absolutely. You got to watch it, and then Uh, you got to watch it again. That's right. That's right. And then there's also a book. So... Reynold Brown, A Life in Pictures, and that came out uh, in 2009, so a little over a decade yeah. ago. Yeah, um, yeah. And and I've been reading up on this book, and I really want to get my my filthy hands on it because we highly recommend this book. Like it is pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah. I saw that somewhere while I was looking at posters, and I also want to get that too. So uh, that would be great. But okay, so let me ask you then. Yeah. Enjoyed talking about these movies. Obviously, we enjoy talking about the posters for the movies. What makes these posters great? Why did why did we talk about them, you know, 50-odd years later, 55 years later? Yeah, how do they have this staying power? Yeah, how do they continue to influence so people? Yeah. You know, I thought a lot about that. Uh, 
and I have classic, right? You got to have your three takeaways. And, right. and so I have, I have my three takeaways. So how about we compare and contrast here All as right, we, go as it. we wrap this up? Okay. I think the first one, and you touched on this really, really well, uh, when you were describing your tarantula poster is composition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the use of perspective, certainly in, uh, attack of the 50 foot woman, is the way the woman is angled, as we talked about, she's straddling the elevated highway, the negative space in the upper left corner for the title, and it all works, and it feels very sci-fi comic book-like. It almost feels like a giant comic book cover. So the visual language is a really, really quick read for the audience. It's like you look at this thing when you're in line to buy your ticket, and you know what you're going to get. You know, there's very Mm -hmm, little mystery mm -hmm. here. How about Mm -hmm. you? Well, you know, I got to say, same thing. And I mentioned the Hocus Pocus with perspective on Tarantula. Yeah. And I love that. I actually love that about both of them. And we joked about 50-foot woman who's probably more like 200 feet in the poster. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but I love that the emotion of being attacked by a radioactive spider superseded logic. Like people, were, you know, it was just like, hey, this is big and scary. Make it big and scary. So I love that. I will point out a little minor faux pas in Tarantula, though. The spider only had two eyes. Oh, man. Which was, I know, but I mean, come on. The poster's magical besides that. But Yeah, at least it got the eight legs right, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. And, you know, the thing we both talked about, too, is the use of primary colors. Yeah. Like on both of these posters. Like we both said the backgrounds are yellow, bright yellow. And I think, you know, there's there was red type on both of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, it's elementary, right? It's like building block colors. It's very quick. It's very bold. Yeah. The skies are yellow. In in my particular poster, the cars are red and blue. The type is red. And all of this color really leads your eye around the poster. So in the attack of the 50 foot woman you almost forget that there's you know you talk about your characters bursting out of the frame and really mm-hmm, planting mm-hmm. their feet on the the credits in this poster in attack of the 50 foot woman you almost don't even see the credits they're very very downplayed mm-hmm, it's a very mm-hmm. geometric lightweight slim condensed typeface and the the blue is the same blue as the cars so it's it almost from a distance disappears and it's really Mm -hmm. all about just the bold illustration but invariably you follow the woman's arm down to her leg and then down it just you know to the crushed uh, semi truck I mentioned and boom it just drops you right into the beginning of these credits and so it's really well done in terms of a layout yeah you know and I was interested in Tarantula to see well what it was this common like to have these just intense um, bits of color and contrast at that time and I looked it up and as I mentioned uh, Rental Brown was doing this bright yellow background and obviously a big black spider so yellow and black just like the most contrast you could probably get nobody else was doing that mm-hmm. uh, at posters at that time um, so it obviously stood out and I'm sure the same thing at, of the time in 1958 with 50 foot woman Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it goes back to think about this guy was doing things with comic books and think about the colors of the costumes of superheroes in comic books. It's all, you know, Superman and Captain Marvel. So I'm sure that some of that carried over uh, into just the, the, you know, the aesthetic here. All right, Todd, but I got to give you my number three. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, as if we haven't already gone lowbrow enough with this podcast, I'm going to, you know, number three for me is sex. Todd, it's 1958. It's a giant woman in a bikini running around. Need I say more? You win this round, my friend, only on a technicality because um, my poster, while it uh, the main subject has eight legs, they're fuzzy and and they're gross and you know they're nothing like the woman on your poster so you win this on a technicality all right so that was the tiebreaker (laughs) that was the tiebreaker and you know what in your honor to support you 
I'm going to buy us a round of zombies at oh, the bar. Oh, that sounds perfect. And then we'll be zombies when we're leaving the bar later on tonight. When we go outside and we start yelling, Harry! <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe it'll be Uber, Uber, <laughs> and I'll still be, I'll still be trying to say, Acromegaly. <laughs> yeah, don't yell that. Okay, don't yell that. All right, till next time. All right, see everyone soon. <laughs>